Welcome back to a complete history of Manchester United. I'm your host, Wayne Barton, author and producer of several Manchester United books and films, joined as always on this journey by the legendary football writer, Paddy Barkley. If you're watching the video live or on replay, give it a like and subscribe and join in the conversation in the comment section below. If you're listening back on the audio podcast, please be sure to subscribe and give us a review on the platform you are listening on. Paddy, um, we said the 59... Uh, the 58-59 season is one of those rarely discussed seasons in Manchester mm-hmm. United history. And this is another one, really, um, the post-Munich clean-up um, in terms of all the post-Munich transition, even of how this squad's going to look. Um, but starts much the same at a pre-season in Germany and another post-start to the season. Um, they lose the first two games. Then they, they hit back with a couple of six-goal wins. Um mm. And then they come up against a Spurs team, Paddy, um, one of the most mm. expensive ever assembled, uh, and lose yeah. five on Old Trafford. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And this was, uh, um, well, I suppose a footnote in history was that this was the Manchester United debut of John Giles, um, who'd been coming to the club from a very young age. There he is, um, midfielder at the time, um, uh, as you rightly say, attacking midfielder. Um, this was, you know, before his uh, Busby's uh, attempt to convert him to a winger, and um, uh, he came in. But it was a torrid debut. He thought he did okay, uh, but the rest of the team didn't. Five-one defeat by an admittedly uh, a Tottenham, a great Tottenham team in the making. A um, hundred and eighty thousand had been spent by Bill Nicholson. Um, who had taken over from Arthur Rowe. And uh, among his best purchases, arguably his very best purchase, was 30,000 to Hearts for Dave Mackay, who formed a wing half partnership with Danny Blanchflower, um, which could be, of course, the, the, the great partnership of Coleman and Edwards had died at Munich. Um, but, uh, and not many would ever bear comparison, but uh, I think it would be fair that Blanche Flower and Mackay would be uh, comparable with Coleman and Edwards as, as a great. So this was a, a tremendous side um, and a particular test for the Manchester United defence, which as you uh, imply was uh, pretty leaky. And, you know, to be up against Bobby Smith, Cliff Jones, you know, with Blanc, uh, Mackay and Blanche Flower probing from the back. It was all too much. Um, and 5 1. But this United did take a lot of batterings, but they handed a few batterings out. And um, without spoiling the story of the season, uh, an interesting statistic is that Manchester United during the season scored more goals than the champions, Burnley, and conceded more than the bottom club, Luton Town. So it was uh, definitely a place for, uh, you know, if you wanted uh, boring football, don't go to that Busby's Man United in 1959-60. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you talk about the Spurs game, and a couple of years earlier when the Babes were still arrive, uh, around and at the pump, even mm. um, they won 4-3 at Old Trafford. You remember the, um, the game where Gaskell played and he made it, basically made it a full, homegrown yeah. 11 yeah. and on that occasion the sports writers had, had sort of made comment on the fact that Blanche Flower was the he was the sort of standard that Edward should be aiming for in terms of rounding his, his game off professionally um mm-hmm. reaching that you know we're talking about the rough edges that were still there in Edward's yes game. Uh, not feeling about... he had to win every game of his own back that that was that that was the, the one of the rough edges wasn't it and yeah. whereas Blanche Flower was always, always captaincy material, all you know, judicious, extremely intelligent um, man, a lovely man as well. I met him in his later life, and um, yes, he he was he was a very good player. Dave Mackay was more of the Edwards type in that he could do everything. Um, you know, he was uh, he used to intimidate. He had a trick to intimidate the opposition, uh, which was that just before the game, he'd go up to the halfway line and he'd boot the ball as high as he could into the air. And as it came down, he'd just take it on his toe, tame it, 
completely and let it fall to the ground. And that was to say, listen, you might you think you can batter me and, and take me on in a fight, you know, because, you know, Mackay was known as a hard man. But even if you win the fight, I can outplay you. You know, I've got the yeah. skill. And, and that, was, that was a great uh, psychological trick. So, yeah, the, 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 a very, very um, good Spurs side, but uh, they still had to wait for their time to come. Of course, Manchester United were still recovering after Munich. I think overall, Wayne, the season was a, was a success, wasn't it? I mean, in the post-Munich context. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not, I mean, we talked last time about um, Busby talking about the second place finish and how it represented mm. possibly like this. He, he felt it was a bit yeah. flattering. Yeah. And I mean, the, we talk about the post Munich thing. Before we talk about the results, let's talk about the friendlies that happened in. So the, the pre season had gone, yeah. again, they'd been in Germany where they played yeah. against teams in Munich and they'd been beaten in games. <clears throat> and and they, they play quite well. They've given a good account of themselves. Then uh, in October and November, they played a couple of friendly games against Real Madrid. By the way, yeah. I think uh, worth discussing because the Spanish club, yeah. they decided in, in the relationship that they built with United in the game that they played against them yeah. um, and the anticipation they had of coming up against them again. And the re- Spanish club are looking forward to that as much as United. Mm. In the, the Munich aftermath, and, and they've now got the likes of Puskas in the team and everything after the, mm. the uprising, they signed all these players. Puskas and Di Stefano, it was like having Ronaldo and Messi in the same team. <laughs> yeah, and, and as the results showed that season, but <laughs> they, um, they showed a benevolence to United that really forged a strong relationship between the clubs at the time. They, they, felt, they basically said, um, they sacrificed the match fee because in those times you'd have the Real Madrid, yeah. like the Arlem Globe Trotters. Well, the great teams of that time were, and so Real Madrid mm. would have a match fee if you wanted them to come and play for you. But they they sacrificed that. They said that United could keep it, and they could also mm. keep the gate receipts. And I think Madrid probably got a small kickback from that, but nothing, basically enough to cover their travel and their, their being yeah, there. But there, they, there was genuine um, fraternity between the clubs. And we're, I, I think largely due to the influence of Don Santiago, Santiago Bernabeu, now immortalized in the stadium, in the name of the stadium. I don't know if it had been named after him at that stage. But uh, they, um, yes, there, there, there was definitely, there was genuine fraternity there. I mean, Bernabeu, as, 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 you, as you know from previous episodes, everyone who's listened to watched previous episodes will know that Bernabeu made his cheeky attempt to to get Busby as, uh, as 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 manager, so that was how highly he rated Busby and how good the relationship was between the two clubs, and it it, it was um, I think you and I have talked about this before how um, Sir Alex Ferguson's normally um, brilliant grasp of history seems to have eluded him when he said of Real of a, a later Real Madrid regime I wouldn't sell that mob of virus, but. Um, <laughs> He, um, although he did sell them David Beckham, didn't he? Mm-hmm. And uh, Cristiano. So, uh, yes, it, it was It was a very, it was Real Madrid really did behave with decency towards the crippled post Munich Manchester United. And the two friendlies was 6 1 and 6, six 5. five yeah. yeah. And um, I presume, Wayne, I don't know if you have any information. My, my guess is they would have flown to Spain. Uh, they, on the Germany pre-season trips, um, they tended to go by, well, they did go by boat and train, which but I suppose was easy to Germany, but they must have flown to Spain, and that would have been, well, Busby and Louis Edwards had flown, hadn't they, the previous season? to uh, final, yeah. Yeah. The fa- and the, sorry, that must have been the first flight. I think the team did fly after that. Um uh, but by now, United were beginning to sort of trust their travel again after Munich. Yeah, they were, they were beaten heavily, 6-1 at Old Trafford. But in the return game, they're actually in front a couple of times. They yeah. quite well showed a really good account of themselves, lost 6-5. And really, you talked about the the, the score lines. They were really reflective of what was happening yeah. in, the, in the league as well. Because, I mean, yeah. the first game... 
which United lost six one came after United lost three nil at City and four nil at Preston. So they were they were right. shipping loads of goals and just when they thought that the the tide was turning, they they started scoring a lot themselves. They they yeah. even went to the Champions Elect on bo- um, not the Boxing Day, a couple of days after Boxing Day, and won four one. So they were showing a good account of themselves, yeah. and then. They went um, just after the New Year party. They went to Newcastle, who were um, they were under the I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm laughing about this, but there is a there's, a, there's two funny. Well, there's, there's one quirk and there's one funny story about this. I think it's a funny story. They um, Newcastle's manager at, at that time was Charlie Mitten, and as every student of United history will know, um, Charlie Mitten angered Busby by defecting to Colombia um, many episodes ago for us and uh, he was the manager of Newcastle at that time and uh, very adventurous he learned a lot although he fell out with Busby his his approach to management was very similar to that of Busby like to entertain and what entertainment the Newcastle fan got fans got as they beat as Mittens Newcastle beat Busby's United 7-3 and I think this was the instance of a famous story which journalists often tell uh, about the parochialism of the local newspapers. In this case, the Manchester Evening News, by now edited by a man called Tom Henry, who was a friend of Matt Busby's and a great dyed in the dyed red in the wool Manchester United fan. And I think this was the instance where Tom, who took a huge interest in the sporting pink on a Saturday evening, went down to the, what we call the stone, you know, where the paper was getting ready for its final printing. And he saw the headline, which was something on this 7-3 defeat by United up at St. James Park. It was something like United take a pasting in Newcastle or something like that. And he said, no, 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 it's far too negative. And uh, he uh, had it uh, replaced by United in 10 goal thriller. (laughs) <laughs> which um and 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 people still talk about that as an as an example of uh, the parochialism uh, of, of local newspapers along with the other one uh, which um was i remember was told about various papers but um uh, i remember in in the case of Aber- the headline aberdeen man lost at sea hundreds of others and then the subtitle one hundreds of other Perish as Titanic goes down. But anyway, that was um, that was uh, that was Tom Henry, a great United fan, and uh, and um, and uh, you know David Meek's boss at the Manchester Evening News. Um, yeah, seven three, um, a ten goal thriller. <laughs> um, United were capable, as we said, of battering teams themselves. They scored um four or more on 11 occasions throughout the league um yeah. six on three occasions we said two in the early season against chelsea and leeds and then um in the second half of the season against blackpool i think you might argue paddy um when busby was saying oh you know i think that we're probably punching above our weight at the moment maybe riding an emotional wave but you might argue that the finalist place in in 58 and the second place finish of 59 had opponents taking United more seriously than, uh, and maybe that was a good thing. Busby liked that, you know, because there was, it was a time anyone could see that United had a major issue at fullback and halfback because of all of that loss of their fullback and halfback. Absolutely right. I mean, so much so they, I mean, they were linked with a lot of top defenders. Um, they actually reached uh, Jimmy Armfield among them, uh, but they actually reached agreement with Rangers for 30,000 quid, a lot of money, um, for Eric Caldo, uh, who was a terrific player, uh, quick and one of the best fullbacks ever to play for Rangers. Uh, and I think Busby may have seen it in him, something of Roger Byrne, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, real class signing that would have been. And the clubs agreed a fee of 30, but uh, Eric Caldo decided to stay in Scotland. Um, you know, to sort of kind of illustrating that Manchester United couldn't just pluck players from wherever they wanted um, and that the money up in the old firm was, was as good as, as, as Busby was allowed to pay as we reached the end of the maximum wage 
era in uh, in English football, there being no maximum in Scotland. Um, but yes, that was uh, they were looking for players all over the field, but they actually got one in terms of a midfield hard man. However, he didn't exactly play in the conventional midfield role. His name was Morris Setters. He played with Bobby Charlton in the play for West Brom, but he had played for the England under 23s along with Bobby Charlton. And Bobby Charlton, you know, when asked by Busby, what do you think? Said, what, Morris, yeah, absolutely what we need. Um, to give a little bit of the power and panache and, uh, well, aggressiveness, really, that they'd lost with the death of Mar uh, Duncan Edwards. So, um, again, 30,000 quid. It's, every player seemed to cost 30,000 quid in those days. 30,000 quid brought him uh, to Old Trafford. And Busby there deferred a little bit to fashion because... All over the country, centre halves, sort of centre backs, as I insist on calling them, were complaining. You know, I'm having to deal with two strikers. You know, you remember how we mentioned last week how the, the 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 attacking inside forward would really be second striker. So the centre halves were feeling very much overrun. So the answer was obviously to go for four at the back. And so Setters would slip in alongside Bill Foulkes. And it was the Busby was edging towards this, um, the fashion for, uh, for a back four, which of course to this day is, um, is the basic formation. But in those days um, was fairly revolutionary. Brazil had taken it up in international in the world terms. Cup, yeah. They were the world champions. In fact, they'd, I think they'd more or less played a back four in the 58 World Cup. Yeah. And, uh, of course, that was the most recent year. Um, so that was that was the fact. And, and Setters was definitely part of the deal was that he would give, United, give Bill Foulkes a little help in there. However, it didn't have an instant effect because, as you rightly say, United were shipping goals as gaily as they were scoring them. Yeah. Um, also, around that time, you had the probably an, um, an admittance from Busby privately, if not if not publicly, that this was stepping up to where United had been previously was going to prove a level too difficult for the likes of Goodwin, Greaves, Cope, and maybe yes. even Carolan. I mean, players who were obviously serving United admirably at the time, but in in terms of where Busby now is sort of a year or two on from the crash really beginning to get a little bit of ambition again of like where they want to take United to, um, admitting possibly again privately that there'd be some concession on the way they did things before when Hardman and Crickmer and Rocker were, and Gibson, they all had this vision of 11 or 9 or 10, 11 youth team players playing for the team. There's a little yeah. bit of concession that they knew that the balance would have to be a little bit more um, liberal between yeah. you know players brought in in order to achieve success quickly. Um, and I think the, the setters transfer was almost expedited by the, the injury to Wilf McGuinness in a reserve team game. Yeah. And this was a strange one because McGuinness had established himself in the number six shirt. He was Edward's mm -hmm. successor to all intents and purposes. Yeah. He was in the number six. He was always playing. But he plays in a reserve game against Stoke and, and suffers this broken leg, which eventually causes him to um, retire completely from football. Not not incidentally, immediately. A lot of people say this, um, say they did immediately, but McGuinness started his coaching badges after this. But he also tried to come back from his injury. He actually played a significant amount of time for the reserves. And when mm. substitutes were eventually introduced, he actually made it as far as being called onto the bench again. But he did never play a senior yeah. game again for United. And yeah, but I mean, Wilf, as every bit, but he connected with Manchester United knows is uh, always is United through and through, and a man with a very big heart. So, uh, especially being so young, as I, I think you've done, it's still only be twenty three. Yeah. Uh, especially being so young, he, he he found it very difficult to cope with the fact that he wouldn't be able to have a career at all, and he fought against that for months and months probably a year, uh, in fact. 
Um, but the signing of setters, as you rightly say, was the writing on the wall. Yeah. Incidentally, I say, I'm, I'm putting the two together, but McGuinness was in the number six shirt. And what that, yeah. uh, he, um, and Campwell moved to number four. Um, yeah. And as we've we've been saying throughout this series, the shirt numbers were important. It was, um, I think Brennan moved into number six after McGuinness's injury. So, yeah. Um, so it wasn't like he was a like for like replacement. It was just that when McGuinness was injured in November, there was a need for that experience in the middle and where, why and Camwell was um, says sorry not Camwell Camwell's a little bit later says so. I was just gonna say where where did we get Noel Campbell from? But, <laughs> um, but he, he he deserves a proper introduction and we'll get one. Yeah, he will indeed. Um, yeah, me, but yeah, yeah it's, isn't it funny how you get those confused? I I do as well because. Um, uh, because of you know their um, ability to switch from one position to another. Yeah. Um, yeah so McGuinness, unfortunately, November um, fifty nine is um, is the end of his United first team career. United's conclusion to the season, Paddy. I mean, it continues with this inconsistency. They were um, win two, lose one. That pattern actually yeah. repeated itself yeah. three times yeah. in a row. Um, United finished seventh. You quite rightly mentioned the the goals, one hundred and two goals scored. 80 goals conceded um but seventh i know they finished second the previous season but seventh was respectable all things mm -hmm. considered it was a decent yeah. um decent return and in the fa cup they knocked out liverpool at anfield mm -hmm. drew sheffield wednesday at home in the fifth round again just like two years earlier football yeah. with this weird romantic sense of because it's cyclical and it can repeat these things yeah. that are completely at random uh, but obviously, the the chances of drawing someone in the fifth round at home is exponentially shorter than mm. they would have been in the third round. So yeah. playing against Sheffield Wednesday, um, oh, this time Sheffield Wednesday win, um, and they'd actually get drawn again um, in the following season's competition. So United's hope for a trophy is over this time round. Um, but with the finish seventh, it's a good performance from them. And then following the conclusion of the season, Paddy, you know, it'd go to North America again. But this time, it's the first time in eight years to play um, 10 games in uh, against local teams, against college mm -hmm. teams, but also mm -hmm. other British teams like Hearts who were travelling over there as well. Mm -hmm. they, in fact, they played four times against Hearts. And yeah. the final game, they play against the Ukrainian national team. The Ukrainian national team at the time, missing two of their best players, but still gave it a good a good go against United. They lost 10-1. Nah. 10-1. And this is the first recorded um, game, even though it's not a competitive game, but a first recorded game, I'm sure, of a United goalkeeper scoring because Harry Gregg stepped up to take a penalty late on, which the Ukrainians thought was taking the mick a little bit, Paddy. So, yeah, I uh, don't blame them. I don't blame them. Harry Gregg... Um... Scoring a goal, I'm sure it was very enjoyable for Harry, but uh, uh, the Ukrainians, uh, I hope it wasn't the 10th goal, because that really would have been unkind. Um, I think if they'd had Shevchenko in the team, it would have been a different result. <laughs> it was long before his time, yeah. Mm. That, that Ukraine... Uh, at that time, would not have been an independent country. No, it so it was, a, it was oh, like a, a Ukraine National eleven. Yeah, formed for, a, yeah, a, 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 what was a state of the Soviet Union at that yeah. time, yeah. Um, but uh, even so, 10-1, 10 10-1's a decent score. And and if it made Harry happy, then, then it's all worthwhile. I'm sure Harry would be the first person to remind people that he um, was the first goal scoring Manchester United goalkeeper. But not the last, was he? Uh, um, has anybody scored since? Michael There's a few. Alex Stepney as well. He will. Oh, uh, Stepney famously got one in a Charity Shield, was it? Something like that. No, more than that, he, he, I think, well, he's first of all, he's United's top goal scoring goalkeeper of all time, mm -hmm. but he also in the. Sorry, guys, but there's a, a spoiler coming up in the relegation season. If you remember, yeah. he's the top scorer at Christmas because he scored two penalties in the first yeah. half of the season. So um, United have a little bit of a history with goal-scoring goalkeepers. But um, mm. Greg... so Harry, wouldn't, Harry wouldn't have enjoyed being uh, overtaken <laughs> at all. He, no. he, he probably never forgave Alex Stepney for that. But uh, yeah, that so that was the first, was it? I didn't know that. Um, Harry Gregg's goal against Ukraine. Um, and in the FA 
well, I mean, you mentioned that Burnley were the champions. Yeah. It was a very, very fine Burnley team, that, by the way, wasn't it? With McElroy and, um, you know, Pointer and uh, um, John Canelli. I bet we hear more about, <laughs> about him in this podcast. Um, so, yeah, a, a, a wonderful Burnley team, uh, worthy champions, even though United did manage to get a festive victory, a big, big win, 4 1 in front of the, their biggest crowd since the war. And um, uh, FA Cup went to Wolves. Yeah. Who, with Stan Cullis edging ahead of Busby once more in the trophy hall. Um, and their captain, Bill Slater, was the footballer of the year. Um, but there was an even more memorable end to the season, postscript to the season, wasn't there? Uh, the European and- Cup. Hamden Park, Glasgow. Uh, This was where the great European team, it was their swan song, really, um, of with Pushkas now added to Di Stefano with Hento flying down the wing. They played Eintracht Frankfurt, who did well, who played well. Uh, And here was another 10, what what Tom Henry would have called a 10-goal thriller. Real Madrid 7, Eintracht Frankfurt 3. In watched by 130,000 people in the Scottish National Stadium, Hamden Park, Glasgow, and it would have been 129,999, but for the attendance of a young Queen's Park teenage player called Alex Ferguson, who got in free. It was the perk of playing for Queen's Park, whose home ground, of course, was Hampden Park at that time. And... Uh, I, I think, you know, Alex Ferguson was just one of 130,000 people whose view of football was kind of coloured forever by that great, great match. And and in particular, the great team in white. Yeah, you would um, also get a knock-on effect to Old Trafford as well, with the, because obviously Madrid were visiting often now yeah. and you know, playing one or two games a season, only for a short period of time. But the, the lasting impression it would have on, on players coming through the youth ranks, they were watching the likes of, um, and um, we'll talk about the likes, the, the young players who we left an impression on in later episodes, but the likes of Ento and, and Di Stefano, it wasn't just that they were great, it was that they worked so hard. And as especially Di Stefano, they they watch him play, the, the young players at United would watch him play and think, how can someone that good still be working as hard as he is um and they realized that that was a standard three he was a very in, if you look at the, the the psychological play that was happening at old trafford and i know that those games were there to they were benevolent um mm. fundraising affairs but they were good yardsticks for busby weren't they they were good yardsticks to say this is how good we are this is how we're coming along yes exactly because he he his you know, dream of being the best in Europe, which which could well have been the case, but from Munich, um, was still there, and um, and but at, yet at the same time, there was the example of Real Madrid almost taunting him of how much further he'd have to go. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the 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 Di Stefano's work rate. Um, and it, it, he was a little bit like a, he had that Duncan Edwards sense of responsibility. You know, he he was, I mean, he was a he was a bit of a. You know, he didn't like losing. Yeah, he hated losing. In fact, do you remember it annoyed him when he saw United players after they'd lost to Real Madrid in the semi final, um, you know, smiling and enjoying the post match banquet. And he said, God, if that had been us, you know, we'd have been ready for a fight, not a meal. <laughs> he had that side to him. He wasn't, he wasn't Mr. Nice Guy. But uh, yeah, that was, um, you know, that was, that was the standard to which United had to aspire. Um, we're still a long way off. Um, well, I, there's no point in, 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 in not saying that in, we've got another eight years to wait, but. It's going to be fun finding out, isn't it, whether United can get back on top in Europe, of Europe. Just three introductees into the squad this season. We'll start with Nobby Lawton. Um, yeah. 
a local lad um, inside forward or wing off, um, or another of those multiple um, versatile players, um, born in Newton Heath. Following yeah. the Munich air disaster, he actually gave up his job as a coal merchant to sign professional with United. Yeah. But while playing for the reserves, he succumbed to the flu. And it, this was a severe case of the flu, actually, because it led to double pneumonia. And, and for a while, he couldn't use his legs. He couldn't walk. Like, so he had to learn to sort of become athletic again. He was out of action for, for months until he made his debut right at the back end of this season um, in April against um, Luton Town in a 3-2 win. Oh. Over the next couple of seasons, he, he would forge a, a strong partnership with Bobby Charlton on the left-hand side. But he, um, yeah, a player of promise for certain, and another one of those versatile players. Uh, we mentioned Maurice Setters earlier. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was going to be a very, very key player. And another who would settle with Bobby Charlton and became very close pals with Bobby Charlton very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone at Old Trafford took to that dominant personality, didn't they, Paddy? They, he came in yeah. to be authoritative, and everyone settled with that, um, yeah. much to Busby's delight. Um, yes. And yeah, as we already mentioned earlier in the episode, he, he played in nominally the full position, but that was very quickly becoming a centre half position as well. Um, and the um, the third man, uh, the third man in chronological in terms of um, uh, positions in the team. This is how we go through the, how the players were introduced. Johnny Giles was the first of those to actually play in the, in the team this season because he played in that September thrashing at home to Spurs. Um, again, we've got him as a midfield forward. We played in a number of positions um, and would have some <laughs> hot-headed conflicts with Busby about where his best position was in fact. Uh, Absolutely, uh, yeah. Very strong-minded man. Uh, um, but he made his way into the number eight position inside forward in, in the early introduction into the side. And, and yeah, as you mentioned, he played outside right as well. He... Mm. Um, he played. He signed pre Munich, Paddy. But it's worth saying that the likes of Murphy and and Armstrong were now working hard to try and find the next talent coming through. I mean, the, you, you in your book um, on, on Busby, your biography of Busby, you, you talked about um, Barry Fry being identified and brought in to the oh, club, yeah. and yeah. and now Mus- Busby. Uh, well, um, Fry had identified or heard Murphy saying in conversation to to the other players. You've got to be like Duncan was. You've got to want mm. to train all the time and get to the top like him. Yeah. Which I think it, when you think about being able to use Duncan in conversation again, it symbolically difficult thing for, for Murphy to do, but obviously one that he thought, you know, this is the right time to do it. The players are ready to hear stuff like this. Quite mm. a quite a bold thing to do, wasn't it? Yes, it was. <clears throat> but um the, the the example was there and although they never talked explicitly about Munich. It was a taboo subject. Um, yeah, there was there's still no harm in using the the um, the, the the example of of, uh, of of Edwards in terms of his. Well, you know, I used the comparison with Di Stefano in, in in terms of his desire to win, his determination, his. Uh, strength of character um absolutely no harm in doing that um in in, in murphy and both be doing that to inspire the young players just yeah. a shame for wilf mcginnis since we're talking about this season that that he who loved or respected edwards more than anyone uh the, that he was unable to do so because of injury yeah, um, let's run through the um, appearances very quickly. Harry Gregg, the first choice goalkeeper, 36 appearances in all competitions, 33 in the league. But mm. David Gaskell, who's now the backup goalkeeper, made nine in the league. Mm. So um, a fair amount of appearances for him. The fullbacks were Shea Brennan, Joe Carroll, and um, nominally named as Ronnie Cope and Ian Greaves as well. So Brennan played 32 in all appearances. Um, in all competitions, sorry, 29 in the league. And all competitions, obviously, are at FA Cup and the league. Um, Caroline with 44 in all competitions, 41 in the league. Cope, 43 in all, 40 in the league. Ian Greaves with just two league appearances. Tommy Heron, just one league appearance. Bill Folks, um, as you mentioned earlier, at this point, he's sort of moving between fullback and centre-back yeah. where they're trying to sort of redefine his position in there. Yeah. Um, 
He makes 42 appearances all all the competitions. He's playing in every single game. 45 mm-hmm. in all competitions, 42 in the league. Freddie Goodwin um, playing that right half position, but he's the one really who suffers when Setters come, comes in because yeah. he's... That's he's right. Playing. He's sold. Um, because as usual, Busby recouped an awful lot of the Setters fee. Um, and, and the players who were to be sold to raise, well, more than half of that 30 grand uh, were... Uh, but the, the best of them was Freddie Goodwin, um, but also um, Harrop went, yeah, and um, and Gordon Clayton, um, the boyhood friend of um, Duncan Edwards, the goalkeeper. He he also went uh, to raise a bit of a bit of cash towards the setters deal. Yeah, um, Goodwin before before moving played 19 games in all competitions, 18 of those in the league. Um, two goals, one in the cup and one in the league. Nobby Lawton, who we talked about earlier, three appearances this season. McGuinness, um, 19 appearances before his injury. Maurice Setters, after coming into the side, played 19 in all competitions, 17 in the league. In that forward line, and we'll get mm. to the star man in a moment, Paddy, but, um, or the star men, should say. Maurice, uh, sorry, Warren Bradley, doing another admirable job, nine goals in 31 games, eight in 29 in the league. Dawson, 15 in 23 in all competitions, 15 in 22 in the league. An incredible return, really. Um, Giles, after coming into the side, scores two in 10 in the league. Mark Pearson, now um, really only on the periphery and really struggling with the, the weight of the post-Munich expectation. And the expectation might be the wrong word. The, the pressure that was on his shoulders, he was really struggling with that. Um, three goals in 10 league appearances. Albert Scanlon, a, a provider from the left, seven in 31 in the league, eight in 34 in all competitions. Albert Quixel stepping up to play at this time a bit more pro- um, prominent in front of goal, 13 in 33 in the league and 13 in 36 in all competitions. The main men up front, um, Bobby Charlton, 21 goals in 40 games, 18 and 37 mm. in the league. But the um, the real success story of the season, Paddy, you could say, yeah. is, is Violet. Um, well, I, I, I think we need to de- absolutely Dennis Violet because um, he scored 32 in 36 league games, smashing Jack Rowley's club goal scoring record in the, for a league season, and uh, which also earned him a, a, a well deserved England debut. So. Um, let's just have a player of the year dinner and raise a cup of tea uh, to Dennis Violet, player of the year and an outstanding candidate and um, thoroughly deserving of it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, 32 in 39 in all competitions. And we should say as well for, for Violet and to talk about how phenomenal that achievement was, nobody scored more than 30 goals in the league again until Cristiano Ronaldo um, is... Ballon d'Or winning season. That's how long that record stood. Um, just an incredible return, really. Um, the team that season, you would say it's Greg, Folks, Cope, Carolan, and then Setters and Brennan once the, the transition had happened in the halfback line. And then Bradley, Quixel, Violet, Charlton and Scanlon in the in the front line. Um, the, the colours remain the same. The United Review remain the same. So it's red, white and black, all white away strip. Um, the handshake... Um, which we're still not quite sure what's going on with the handshake on the front yeah. there. No, as um, we mentioned, the, the the player has his right hand out, and the man in the suit with the United the red tie and rosette returns it with a left-handed handshake, um, and we still have to get it got to the bottom of that mystery. <laughs> Will we ever? We don't know. Um, <laughs> The average attendance at Old Trafford that season, 48,012. A um, really good crowd again. Um, the, the key results with such inconsistency, and you can't say that United, United are stable, which is a really good thing post-Munich, but they're not. It's difficult to sort of pinpoint them all the way, say, oh, this is a moment of progress. Like the previous seasons, we've looked and said, oh, well, this is where Busby made changes and we've managed to kick on. United was still a little away from doing that, but they were stabilising. Um we did mention it should be said that game against Burnley with the champions elites was probably the biggest result of the season because it was a sign of what this team could do if they were on song. Um, 
You mentioned elsewhere in football, Burnley, the champions, Wolves winning the FA Cup and Rail winning the European Cup. But, um, there was a, a poignant occasion in the season. Wolves obviously unsuccessful in the European Cup again, but they came up against Red Star Belgrade, Paddy. Yes, they did. And so it was um, 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 back, back, to, back to Belgrade for, for English football. What was it Roger Byrne had sung? We'll meet again. And um, uh, Wolves actually knocked out um, Real Madrid, um, clinching it at Red Star Red Belgrade, Star. clinching it with a 3 0 win at a, an ecstatic Molyneux. And who did they get in the next round? Barcelona, mouth watering. Well, until they lost 9 2 on aggregate, um, once again putting. English uh, pretensions to being the best in the world into a wee bit of uh, context. Absolutely. Um, incidentally, elsewhere in football as well, the, the last football games to be played on Christmas Day were, were held in 1959 throughout this season. The United's last game on Christmas Day had been the previous season. They played the two games against Burnley were, were over Boxing Day and then two days later on the 28th. So a, a big changing point in, in English football as well as players were allowed to enjoy the Christmas dinner, which I'm sure they were very happy for. Um, mm. United would be looking for some cheer in the following season as they tried again to establish some consistency with their new look team. Um, if you're watching the video, please give it a like and subscribe. Join in the conversation in the comment section. If you're listening back on the audio podcast, please be sure to subscribe, give us a review on the platform you are listening on as well. We will we'll be back to discuss the 1961-62 or 60-61 season even. Yeah. Um, United continue their thing. And obviously, by now, there are plenty of episodes. If you're watching this live uh, as we're in real time as we're releasing the episodes, and you know that there are already plenty of episodes back there in the backlog number of episodes dedicated to United in the post-sport history so get back in there if you uh, are watching this as one of the first episodes you've watched there's plenty of stuff in there from the origins of the Busby years as well so we will be back next time to discuss the 60-61 season thanks for watching 